How about now? Can you see me now? Are we good? I absolutely hate computers, I swear. Is it still waiting for me? You gotta be kidding me. <sighs> oh man. Guys, if you can see me, please let me know. Uh, Cause it tells me I've been streaming for 20 seconds now. Okay. Somebody can see me. We're good? All right. Jeez. Oh, I hate computers. <sighs> well, that will definitely throw a wrench in your uh, <laughs> in your start. Anyway, hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back. I have to say that at the beginning, otherwise, I swear I just can't I can't make a video. That's kind of my thing. Um, today, we're going to talk about knowing when to fix your mistakes, your your happy little accidents, as Bob Ross would say. What you can get away with in a paint job, what you can fix at the end, or what you need to fix right away, and sometimes what you can't fix at all. Uh, there aren't that many happy little accidents in custom finishing. Usually every mistake kind of needs to be fixed, but we'll try and get through some of the common ones. And then hopefully I can answer some questions. As always, I'm, I'm not really able to read your guys' questions as I go generally. I'll try and get to some of them if I can. Uh, we do have that super chat thing enabled and I certainly don't have a script. As you guys know, you've seen my videos. I never do. Um, so if you use that, your stuff will pop up big and I'll, I'll try and answer your questions as I go. Uh, I assume you know how to do that. Two of you have in the past. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll try and get to some of those, especially at the end of the video, if I can. As always, I'm going to try and keep this to about 30 minutes uh, so that it's easier for people to. You thought it was about Bob Ross. Yeah, well, Bob Ross is awesome, but he makes better videos than me. So I uh, watch his. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to try and keep this to about 30 minutes so it's easier to watch over again if you need to catch any of the information that you may have missed and so it's easier for other people to watch. Hopefully YouTube doesn't cut me off at the, at the end like they did last time. That was abrupt and ridiculous and I'm not really sure about the reason for it. But yeah. Quick disclaimer, uh, I've had uh, considerably more to drink than I usually do before I start these, but I think we're going to be fine. Um, so... We're going to talk about some of the custom or some of the normal mistakes that you would see in custom finishing, the, the kind of typical ones, the ones that I get asked about a lot. Again, if you have questions about specific ones, ask them. I'll, I may or may not uh, see them, but we'll try and get to some of them at the end. Uh, you may have to repost them at the end. <laughs> um, so let's start with one of the most common ones and, and one of the ones that's easiest to talk about, and that's runs. A lot of people get runs in their paint because they're painting too fast, too heavy, putting too much paint on, or if they're kind of just getting started using an HVLP gun, for example, maybe they thin it too much, temperature isn't warm enough, so they're not getting it drying quick enough. Um, it's a common mistake and people panic about it. And there are ways to fix runs on the fly, fix runs when they happen, chase them out, take them off with you know, a number of tools. But I assume that uh, if you're watching me, you're probably not a custom guitar painter who does 20 a day. So you, you have a little bit of time to, to get this dealt with. I could be wrong. There are some custom guitar painters who have reached out to me about stuff. But yeah, I assume you're not running that volume. So patience is key here. There's not a whole lot of exigency to dealing with something like this. If there's a run in your paint, you can simply let it dry for however much time it takes. And that, in some cases, if you're putting it on that heavy, can be you know, a couple weeks, uh, maybe even more, but usually it's less than that. With a lacquer, for example, it's, you know, half an hour usually. Um, you can let it dry and then just sand it smooth and flat and keep going as though it never happened, okay? Generally speaking, if you're letting your paint dry fully, you're gonna have to sand it before the next coat anyway. Now that doesn't apply to lacquers because they melt in, we've talked about this many times, but usually you need to let it dry. So. Just let that run dry and go ahead and sand it out. Simple as that. Uh, this, you know, well, you know, that's that's about it for runs. Let's move on to the next one. Um, orange peel. Orange peel is also a common issue. We all get it. It comes up, you know, even if you're you're great at setting up your stuff, sometimes the temperature is a little different or your mix is a little different, and it happens. Now, a lot of people ask me, can I get my orange peel out now? Or do I have to? Can I wait until the end? And the answer is, generally speaking, for orange peel, 
it's a minimal issue. You can get it out at the clear coat stage. It doesn't really matter if there's a little orange peel in your color coat. You can just scuff that a little before you put your clear on. You don't have to necessarily sand it flat. There's an exception though. That's not always uh, the case if you're spraying a metallic over that. So if you do a base coat and then you want to fire a metallic over that, suspend it in clear, for example, you're going to want to sand that flat because when you put the metallic on, it'll pool in the little orange peel divots. Hopefully you all know what orange peel looks like. It looks kind of like the surface of a golf ball or an orange. Uh, so it'll pool in the little in the little divots and you'll get little concentrations of metallic and you get to see that after and you don't want that. So if you're doing a base coat where a metallic is going over top and you've got a bunch of orange peel, you're going to want to sand that out. Let that dry similar to a run, sand it flat, then fire your metallic on there. And then you can move on with your clear coat and any orange peel that's kind of left at that stage, you can get out at the end. I'll see if I can take a couple of questions here. I'm going to have to lean in awkwardly. Any tips for painting outside? Oh God. Um, well, if you're using a lacquer, don't paint in direct sunlight. Okay. A lot of people think, you know, it'll dry faster if they paint in the sun, sun will, it, it's not good for your lacquer, particularly in nitrocellulose. You get weird yellowing, some cracking, all sorts of funny stuff can happen there. So that, that's my main tip. <laughs> if you're painting outside, don't paint in the sun. Ideally, don't paint outside. There are a lot of contaminants out there. There are bugs. Bugs are weirdly attracted to paint for some reason. Uh, so painting outside is difficult. If you can, set up a little booth. So you get some PVC pipe, create a frame, put a fan and uh, wrap it in poly, and set up a little booth. There are videos out there on how to do that. I've never done one, but I've seen them work. Uh, when, okay, when you're doing a satin clear finish, do you need polishing? No, um, generally you can't polish a satin finish. There are a couple ways to kind of do it, but generally speaking, your satin finish has got to come straight off the gun or straight out of the can, I suppose, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, spraying that way. So what you want to do is get your second last coat as flat as possible and then fire your satin on there. And here's a weird one that a lot of people don't know. The matting agents that they use to make matte clears and satin clears and whatnot, um, those are an additive. So the paint isn't naturally really like that. It's naturally gloss. They add those in and those can cause a little bit of hazing, almost like a solvent pop type thing, if you know what that is. Uh, but even if you don't know what that is, it causes a little white haze. It's not quite blushing. So if you're doing a satin or a matte, really the safe way is to build up your clear coat with a gloss, let it dry, sand it smooth to, you know, 800 or 1,000 grit, no higher than that, or you won't get proper adhesion, and then put one coat of satin on there for a nice smooth final finish. That's kind of, a, you know, I won't call it best practice because, I mean, professionals don't have time for that and they don't generally do that, but that's the safe method, if you will. Okay, uh, let's move on. We did orange peel. I keep hitting the wrong mouse here. I've got my work computer and my personal computer. I do have a, just a couple keynotes about what uh, I'm trying to teach you how to fix. Ridges. Ridges uh, will occur when you're taping off to do a multicolor paint job. And a lot of you are doing, you know, two-tone or stripes or recently and unfortunately, uh, Eddie Van Halen style Frankenstrat paint jobs, the EVH um, kind of replicas. You're going to get ridges between your paint lines. Okay, and usually you don't want those in the final finish. I can't tell you if Eddie had them in his or not. He very well may have. The thing was pretty rugged, rugged rather. Um, but uh, you're you're gonna want to get those out probably, and you can either do that a little bit, kind of as the process goes, or you can do it right at the end. What I like to do is ease those ridges ever so slightly. So you you can probably get an idea of how it, how it works, right? You put down a coat of paint, you put your tape lines in there, and then you put your next coat of paint and it builds up against the tape and you get a ridge where the paint is when you peel the tape off. And you can feel that, you can see it. Um, but what you can do is you can take a little bit of scotch brite or some fine grit sandpaper or even a razor blade if you know how and ease those back a little bit so they're not as abrupt. And I find that that makes them easier to take out at the end. But really, when it all comes down to it, what you're going to have to do is clear coat and put enough on that it builds up past that ridge and then sand flat and polish it out. So those you can leave to the end because you're going to have to do that at the end anyway. 
nice bottle setup. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's that's my friend. Pretty much trying to get through a couple of your comments here. All right, uh, next up, dust. Dust is one you kind of got to deal with right away if you want to deal with it. Uh, you can denib a finish at the end, but you don't want to be clear coating over dust. So if you get dust in your paint job, try and sand it smooth, get it out of there, put another coat of your base, your color, whatever it happens to be, if you can, or don't if it doesn't look like it needs it. But if you start clear coating over dust, and I, this is probably obvious, so I apologize, but I have had the question. If you start clear coating over dust, you're going to end up with dust trapped under your clear, and it's going to be a lot harder to get out. Now, we have done a specific video, I think, on how to avoid dust, and there are a few different techniques for it, like wiping down your surface before you paint it, getting cross airflow to keep dust off, and making sure that it's not pulling air from a dusty area, uh, wetting down your spray booth or even the floor around where you're working because water traps dust and sucks it down to the floor, but you need to get it reasonably wet uh, so that the dust doesn't poof back up again as you walk. Uh, and obviously you can't be getting water all over your thing that you're painting, so you have to be careful. But we've done a video on methods for avoiding getting dust in your paint job. But if you do get dust in your paint job, you're gonna have to take it out kind of right away. Fingerprints. Why are you guys always leaving fingerprints in your paint jobs? You know how often I get this question, I touch the paint to see if it was dry and I left a fingerprint? Like, stop doing that. Touch in the, in the pickup cavity or something, come on. Anyway. If you do leave a fingerprint, it's a lot like a, a run. There are ways to deal with them, uh, but mostly those ways involve firing a bunch more paint at, their, at, the, at the piece, and that's risky and can cause cracking and other problems. And you guys know that there are issues that arise when you put too much paint on at once. So the easiest way to deal with a fingerprint is simply let it dry. Let it dry, sand it smooth, put some more paint on there. Even if you sand it and it doesn't get quite 100% smooth, that's fine. Sand it close to smooth, clean it, and put another coat on, and it will usually kind of melt away. Now, the same goes for very, very minor scratches, but we have done a video on whether you can fill scratches with clear or with paint. Uh, if there's anything significant there, you're gonna have to sand back and recoat or sand and fill if it's really big. Clear coat won't fill in scratches. They will fill in sanding scratches. For example, like 800 grit scratches, you're gonna to wanna to sand to 800 grit usually before you clear coat, depending on the type. It fills those in no problem. So you don't have to worry about sanding marks showing up in your clear, not an issue. But actual scratches, any kind of actual damage, you need to get that out beforehand. That will show up not only as an indent in your clear, but it'll also, you like my hand motions? <laughs> so you guys don't know what indent means. It'll show up not only as an indent in your clear, but it will also show up just by looking at it. Like even if you don't have the light angle to see the indent, you'll be able to see kind of a scratch underneath. So you need to deal with that. Give Brad some thumbs up. Thanks, Moyle. Much appreciated. Uh, all right. Mild waviness. So sometimes you're going to get a finish that has a little bit of a wave to it. And that's probably to do with surface prep. 99% of the time, maybe you've got a wood that's got a little bit of wave to it, you know, like pine kind of has that, some other types. Uh, or maybe you just have sanded with your fingers when you were trying to prep your wood or your sealer. And so you've created little waves in your paint. Ideally, you block those out, you get them out with a sanding block at the surface prep stage. If not, some stage thereafter before the clear. But if we're being honest, you're not really gonna see those most of the time in your finish, unless you're doing something you know, special, something like a candy paint job or like a very interesting sparkle paint job, then you'll see a little bit of a difference in the way that that paint concentrates over the, over the surface. For the most part with a relatively standard paint job, you're not really going to see that. It's not going to be show car finish if you if you leave it to the <laughs> to the ending stages and then sand it out when you're doing your polishing work, but it'll still look good. Uh, and for most people who watch this channel, it's probably fine. You can leave that to the end. If you're selling your paint jobs, deal with it at the surface prep stage. You know, 
you, you got to get that stuff out beforehand. But if you're not, if it's, you know, you're, you're looking for just a decent paint job that you can be proud of, probably not something that you need to deal with before the clear coat stage. In fact, you may not even see it. Hello from Calgary, rivalry glare. What are we competing for now between Edmonton and Calgary? I mean, hockey's done. Are we just trying to see who gets the worst COVID numbers? So it seems like lately. Will gloss lacquer bond with polys for touch-up repair? Uh, if the poly has dried 100% and you sand it appropriately, yeah. Lacquer will bond mechanically to that. It's not what you would generally see from a professional repair job, but it can be used. Now, lacquer, this is a complete tangent. We're digressing entirely, but lacquer is very easy to repair because it melts into itself. Poly, not so much. You generally end up with witness lines where the poly is sanded and then, you know, sprayed on top. You can kind of see where that happened. But yeah, we've seen, I've seen people use uh, lacquer for poly repair before. I've done it on a couple of a couple of jobs back in the day when I was repairing my own stuff. It can work. Can you put nitro clear coat over an acrylic? Is it a water-based acrylic? Probably. Then yes. Uh, it's not the best option, but like, for example, an auto air automotive waterborne acrylic, pretty awesome paint. Actually love this stuff. Use it for all my airbrush work. Almost. Uh, you can put a nitrocellulose lacquer finish over that. You let that stuff dry. It dries extremely quick, especially under airflow. And there's really no solvent in it. Like there's hardly anything in there that can react. So you can put almost anything over it. And I've done it with a nitro clear over top because the guy wanted, you know, this brilliant acrylic undercoat finish, but he wanted a nitro that would age over time. It worked fine. Tested it out a couple of times first. No issues. You can do it. Thanks for the polite Canadian answer. You're quite welcome. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. The next uh, common problem, spatter. Uh, not so common with those of you who use HVLP guns, although it does happen, but a very common question for people using spray cans. And I've done a couple videos on how to prevent spatter, which is what you should be doing. Try to avoid it. Uh, among them, you know, maybe warm your can up a little bit. Please don't put it in the microwave. Just warm it up in some in some warm water uh, uh, or that sort of thing. Make sure your nozzle is clean. But also, oddly, the most common one, if you're getting paint on your fingertip when you spray, you're putting your finger over top of the cap and you're you're stippling. You're you're spraying paint into the tip of your finger and it's causing spatter. I know that sounds dumb, but so many people do that. Just pull your finger back a bit or get one of those trigger attachments. Anyway, if you get spatter in your paint job, well, you're going to want to sand that. Here's the funny part. It's the same color. Uh, you would think you could wait until the end, but that stuff shows up. It shows up like crazy. I don't know why, but it does. So you're going to want to let that dry and sand it out or put your next, if you're on your like coat number one of one color, put your next coat on and see if it disappears. Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes it'll just flow out into your next coat. If you recoat just a little sooner than usual, that's fine. But generally what you want to do is just let it dry and sand it out, get it out of the way. Now don't wait until the end. That's not a, and I can get away with it thing. It's not a happy little accident. You want to get it out as soon as you can. I think that's about it for the really common ones. Nothing else uh, comes to mind. Diamond sandpaper is um, outstanding. Thank you, Michael. I, I want to try it. I haven't yet. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get my hands on some when I have a little bit more time to test it out. But for the rest of you, if you're looking for a recommendation, I trust uh, Michael. He makes guitars. He knows what he's talking about. So if he says diamond sandpaper is outstanding, he, I'm sure, is correct. Jim, pull my finger. Uh, Present it to me, I guess. <laughs> Can you use key to dye to color a maple fingerboard red? And what's the best way to finish it? John, you can. Uh, key to dye is fine for, uh, for dyeing a maple fretboard. The 
the thing you need to watch out for is some fretboards, particularly on kick guitars, come with sealer on them. And if you've got a fretboard with sealer on it, your die is not going to soak in properly. So you need to you need to know. You need to check that first. If it is unsealed, if it's just raw maple, you can dye it. In terms of finishing it, that's up to you. But generally what you see is people do maple fretboards either raw or they do them with lacquer. You don't need to oil them. Uh, they're very tight grained. But if you're going to finish them, it's generally with lacquer. And I'm going to go ahead and predict the next question here. You're worried about the frets. You want to know what to do about the frets. Well, make sure your frets are leveled and polished first. Uh, and as we've talked about, paint needs something to grip onto, right? Unless it's able to bond chemically, it needs something to grip onto. It's not going to grip onto the metal. It's not going to bond properly to the metal. It may form a skin over the metal. So what you need to do is spray your neck and then very, very carefully using an appropriate, and there are specific knives that are kind of one-sided that are good for this, but you can use a scalpel if you're careful. You need to basically cut at an angle under each of your frets, and you can just peel the paint right off of the fret. It's not easy. It might take some practice, but that's how you do that. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> do I need to primer first for FX pedal chassis? I don't know what effects, oh, for an effects pedal. Yeah, if it's made out of metal, you're gonna wanna prime first. This is, uh, again, a tangent, but hey, we're, we've got five minutes left and we might as well do a few of these. Metal is one of those things, much like plastic, but not quite as bad, where paint doesn't like to stick to it on its own. Uh, so you wanna abrade it first so that the paint has something to grip onto, but then you want to also prime it. Primer works as a bridge between products like metal and paint. And specifically, you want a self-etching primer if you can get one. You should be able to get one. They're, they're common. A self-etching primer that's going to be able to etch in and bond onto that metal. And then you can just sand the primer smooth and paint on top of that. While we're on the topic, if you're doing plastic, there are plastic compatible primers. I like to use adhesion promoter. So I scuff up my plastic. I put a little adhesion promoter on there. And then I go ahead with my base because all we really need is something to make it stick. We don't need like a primed base like we do on metal. Adhesion promoter is basically paint glue. I've never heard of K-Bond pigments and dye. No. Should I be looking into those? I used color tone. I've used a few different dyes. K-Bond. Maybe I'll write that down. Thanks. Am I caught up? Am I caught up on questions? <laughs> you, you guys may have noticed, I think I'm caught up now, but if, particularly if you've been messaging me on Facebook, I am way behind. I'm sorry. I'm trying to catch up. Uh, I have a little bit of time off coming up, aka I'm taking this weekend off from the day job. So hopefully I can get caught up on everything. Uh, but I have been wildly far behind. I've been working like 14 hour days, which is not a problem. I like doing that, but, uh, it has caused me to get, yeah, a little far behind on, on the YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram comments. So I apologize if you've been waiting and, you know, a ridiculously long time. I'm trying to get to it. It's, it's a crazy time of year. Sorry. <laughs> Kevin King says, every time I put on my mask, I hear your theme song. You're welcome, buddy. <laughs> I like that intro. Uh, starting guitar kit. There are uh, there are a few good options out there for Les Paul kits from a variety of manufacturers. Uh, as you, uh, who am I looking at here? Canon. As you will know, I generally use Solo. I've done a couple kits from other places. Uh, Tom Top. I'm not not a big fan of. Those Muslati kits, not a big fan of. I've, I've had some problems with those. Uh, the one kit I did from Guitar Fetish wasn't very good. I've had success with solo music gear. Most of the people I've talked to about it have as well. But I've heard, I think, two, maybe three people have some trouble. Uh, so keep that in mind. It depends on what you want to spend, right? Like if you want a really, really nice kit, you can go 
I, Kiesel may or may not still do them. Precision Guitars does them, and they are apparently fantastic. I've never bought one. Crimson Guitars does them, and I can speak from the one experience I've had with them. Their kits are great. Uh, Solo is less expensive, and I've had good success with them. They, they make a good quality kit. You can see the, the Les Paul kit that I did in the background there. That was one of theirs. It's got the spalted maple top. Not sure if they still have that model per se, but they've got some good stuff. I would suggest something that doesn't have a figured top if you're just getting started. If it's your first one, do like a Les Paul Jr., something like that. Those figured tops are a little tougher to get a nice smooth finish on because the wood's uneven, for lack of a better term. It's got open and closed grain. It absorbs unevenly, and it just makes things a little bit more complicated in terms of sealing, leveling, and finishing. So those are my recommendations if you're looking at uh, a starter kit in the Les Paul style. Six dollars for two ounces. Nice, nice, Michael. I'll take a look at that. Uh, Gary, the two times ultra cover, and just so we're clear on this, two X, the two two times ultra cover. That's what the two X from Rustoleum is. It's not the same as a two K. A lot of confusion going on there. Two X and two K, not the same. Two X is double cover. Two K is two component. Uh, will that adhere to walnut properly since walnut is somewhat oily? It can. Uh, it often does, but there are a lot of oily woods out there, like, uh, you know, ebony, for example. I don't know why you would want to paint over ebony. Please don't do that. But anyway, if you're painting over an oily wood, my recommendation to you is that you just wipe it down first with something that removes oil. Acetone is what I generally use. I just give it a quick wipe with acetone. It takes all that oil out of there, it dissolves it, gets rid of it, and then you're good to go. You paint it like anything else. <laughs> Turtle wax on a true oil finish. Are we talking, uh, Carl, are we talking like a normal wax or are we talking a polishing compound? You can wax it like a carnauba wax, like you would use on your car. You can wax it, but I, is that what you're asking? Uh, because that's not the same as a polishing compound. So if you're trying to get it all glossed up and polished, you want a polish or a polishing compound, not a wax. Oh yeah, yeah. You can you can use that on. Uh, you can use the polish and the compound on true oil. You just need to give it lots of time to dry first. Uh, and you need to make sure you've got a reasonable finish built up. Don't don't go crazy with it. It's a much softer finish. It doesn't have the impact and scratch protection of some of the other finishes, especially not like a poly. Um, so be gentle. That's the kind of thing that you're probably going to want to buff by hand if you're not you know, really used to using a buffer because it will eat right through it. It'll take it off uh, if you're using like a buffing wheel or something. So be very careful, but you can... You can polish it up, yes. How high of sand grit should you go before it doesn't make a difference in scratches after polishing? It depends on the polish. Um, okay, and that's that's going to be my last question because we're at 8.30. Uh, but this is an important one. It depends on a couple things. The polish that you're using and the polishing method, if you're using like a big buffing wheel, versus a hand polishing wheel versus polishing by hand. Some polishes will take out, take out 1200 grit scratches. Some will hardly take out 2,500 grit scratches. You work your way through the compound and the polish. To take a look at what the polish says. Most of them you can get away with 1200 or 1500 grit before you move on to the compound and then the polish. Uh, but again, it depends on the method that you're using. And it kind of depends on who you ask. Some people say you want to use as few grits as possible. You want to sand smooth with like a 1200 grit. And if you can take out a 1200 grit scratch with your compound, do it. One grit, nothing more. And that's fine. Uh, less risk of sanding through, less risk of creating cross scratches, all of that. There's merit to that. Uh, but for example, a lot of the, uh, the guys who do professional finishing on cars, for example, will use a 
3M. They can easily take out a 1200, but none, nonetheless, they'll start with a thousand or a 2000, depending on how their first, how their finish looks off the gun. And then they'll go 3000 and then 5000, and then they'll go three types of compound. Uh, and they get the show car finish at the end. So I, I wouldn't say that there's one single right answer to that question. As always, wish there were. Um, it just depends on what you're using, what uh, techniques and equipment, what product, and what theory you subscribe to in a way. Hope that helped. <laughs> All right. We went on a couple tangents there. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed my happy little accidents video. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. I appreciate it. Feel free to ask any other questions you have after this live uh, stream is over. All of your comments will disappear, unfortunately, but then you can throw them onto the video itself when it goes up, which should be right away, I think. I don't really know how that works. Um, but you can toss them on there and I'll do my best to answer them. And as always, guys, if you see other people's questions and you know the answer, feel free, answer them, help out. I always appreciate it. You guys have great insight. A lot of you really, really know your stuff and, uh, and it's good that we have a, a bit of a community here that helps each other out. So yeah, thanks for watching. Thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I would appreciate it. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, although it would be kind of weird if you were watching this uh, in those circumstances, but you do you. And uh, have a good one. I'll see you next time. Let me see if I can uh, push this end stream button before it gets awkward. Bye.